day 170 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russian occupation of Ukraine. Chelsea here, and today is just a quick update as I take a bit of a simplified and down-to-earth approach to the happenings on the ground in Ukraine. Now, starting off, as always, I like to take a quick look at the Russian personnel losses and things of that nature there. So in terms of killed and wounded, uh, there is 43,200 killed and about uh, 130,000 wounded. Now, this is a very uh, indicative or estimate figure here because you'll see that the wounded figure is three times the amount of the killed. So typical war logic dictates that it's about three to five times the amount of wounded as opposed to what is killed there. Again, take it with a grain of salt sometimes, but it is what it is. And uh, next up, we have a look at some of the military hardware. So there's a, an additional eight armored combat vehicles lost by the Russians, three tanks, which is always a big deal there, and artillery and an additional aircraft there as well. Now, moving back to the deep state map. So let's see, first of all, in fact, we start off outside of Ukraine today in Moscow. So Russian state controlled media reported on the 11th of August that a fire broke out at a military base just north of Moscow city. Now this is happening a lot lately. It's embarrassing really. So either Ukraine caused it, which is embarrassing, or Russian safety standards uh, aren't what they should be and are very low, so that's also embarrassing. In this case, it was probably just a genuine fire given its far proximity to the front lines of the war there. So I'll give it to Moscow in this case. It, uh, it wasn't the Ukrainians at this time. Uh, moving across to uh, the, the upper front lines in the Sumy Oblast, so the northern front line here. So the Sumy Oblast governor said on August the 11th that the region had been shelled with artillery and mortars. There were no casualties reported among the residents, but the attacks have burned wheat fields and damaged a couple of residential buildings within the Oblast there. So not sure what uh, was being aimed for. Moving across to where the real front lines tend to begin uh, in Kharkiv. So we got some news overnight. There was anti-aircraft missile units of the Ukrainian armed forces that destroyed two Russian caliber cruise missiles launched from the Black Sea. Now, if we zoom out a bit and have a look, the Black Sea is quite a distance away. It's not even the Sea of Azov. It is over here. So in order for Russia to do that, if I just pull up the... Uh, ruler i don't think you can see that it might be outside of the screencast but that's about 500 kilometers there uh, from uh, bottom to top which means now it means that russia does have this capability it's quite quite a far distance they don't seem to use it that much uh, potentially the reason for that is they well, it's been reported that they are running low on smart weapons high precision weapons those sorts of things there so you don't see this happen uh, every day Moving across to the, the Donbass region here now. So the Ukrainian military said intense shelling and airstrikes were felt across the entire eastern front line here of the Donbass. So there is actually no front line changes on the map if I go backwards and forwards in the day here. Nothing at all really across the whole sector, the whole country. But there was a lot of things happening. So in Kramatorsk, for instance, Russian troops shelled uh, Kramatorsk and Kurakov overnight there. Then down to Bakhmut, which is now we're really moving into the, the hotly contested areas of the front line, city of Bakhmut. Uh, the Ukrainian military also said it was also able to repel forces, uh, Russian forces pushing toward Bakhmut and Advika, uh, Adivka. Now, I'm just gotta find Adivka. I think it's a little bit lower down here below New York, which exists. Uh, Advika, here it is, wow, a lot further down. But the, yeah, the, the Russian shelling is certainly said to be intensifying a lot on the front lines there. They've just decided to, to intensify things uh, because it was a bit slower in the last week. Speaking of this whole area, uh, there is a, a little village called Piski. So Russia is absolutely bombarding this little village of Piski with thermobaric rockets, which is illegal to use in civilian areas under UN law. And 
The Mabaric rockets are kind of like oxygen sucking vacuum bombs that result in massive fireballs causing massive destruction in their wake and are designed to destroy reinforced buildings effectively there. Now, even though all this happened, the Russian forces were repelled on this very front line again today. Moving on to the Zaporizhia, actually, no, we'll move across to, uh, yeah, no, the Zaporizhia region. There's something happened here in this uh, sort of northeastern suburb of Vilnyansk. Here, yeah, so fire in the fields, uh, there was a fire in the fields near Vilnyansk, reportedly after an explosion occurred, but not a great deal of extra details on that one there. Moving across to Kherson, very hotly contested area again of the war on the north side of the dam. In fact, the very, very north side of the dam, right here. So there was an explosion of an ammunition dump reported in Vasil, a Russian ammunition dump, I'll say there, right above the dam that isn't allowed to be blown up by either side for, for UN reasons again, uh, UN laws really. But what the Ukrainians are doing here is since they can't take out the dam, they're making it unfeasible or infeasible uh, for Russia to have any real supply lines going uh, to support the Kherson-based front line of the Russian war effort. So there's not many points where Russia can actually supply this northern bank right here. And there are a few extra bridges here, but a couple, but they're, they're just not really usable at this point either. Again, because of a, a good Russian offensive taking them out effectively. Now, uh, let's move to a, an area near Mar Maripol. Uh, let's see, I've just got to find it on the map uh, if I can locate it. Uh, a town called uh, Berdyansk. Now, there were uh, explosions reported near Berdyansk there. Now, this is Ukrainian striking deep within enemy lines here, so always good to see they've got that. Uh, here it is, right there. I'm taking a long time to find this one. Good to see that uh, Ukraine has this this uh, offensive capability there. Okay. Now, uh, moving to Crimea. As we know, going back to the Ukrainian Crimean offensive uh, from two days ago at the Saki airfield right here. Now... Ukrainian Air Forces said uh, it believed up to a dozen Russian aircraft, including fighter aircraft, were destroyed on the ground in Tuesday's dramatic explosion at the, the Saki Air Base there in Crimea. Now, the UK MOD, also known as the United Kingdom Ministry of Defense, said that Saki was primarily used as a base for the aircraft of the Russian Navy's Black Sea Fleet. And also that the fleet's naval aviation capability is now significantly degraded as a result of this Ukrainian effort. So that's certainly good to see there. And the photo here effectively shows a bit of a before and after. So uh, certainly not unscathed by any means there with their fighter aircrafts. Now, let's see, uh, moving across to a bit of the news. Um, in terms of Zaporizhia or the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the US is calling for a demilitarization zone of the ZPP, so the nuclear power plant there, as you'd expect. You don't want any uh, unexpected nuclear fallout for certain. Also, uh, news regarding the US, uh, the uh, Russian military aircraft have entered the Alaskan Air Defense Identification Zone at least three times this week with a photo here. The US military also distributed this photo of the second uh, incident from the air showing an F-22 flying uh, alongside a uh, visual range of a, an, a Russian uh, IL-20 aircraft. Now, this is nothing new. Russia does this all the time. I, I think at least from what I've been following a couple of times a year, testing the US's air defense zones, that sort of thing. And I, I'm not surprised at all that Russia would want to do this right now because uh, they want to show that they've still got an offensive capability against the USA, which this is just for show. I really don't think they've got any sort of offensive capability to uh, be in two major theaters of war at any one time. So it's, it's just not feasible for them at all. 
Uh, moving on to some information about EuroAid. So uh, a conference in Copenhagen raised $1.5 billion for military aid to Ukraine from a consortium of uh, 26 of mostly European countries. So it's always good to see Europe also providing this financial assistance alongside the USA. Moving up to Estonia. Now this map doesn't show it, but uh, we'll move to Google Maps here for instance. And Estonia is no longer accepting Russian visa holders into their country and is calling on other governments to follow such steps. It's a, it's a really ballsy move for Estonia who is obviously on the border with, uh, with Russia right there. And uh, to top it off in another ballsy move, Latvia right here, also on the border. Uh, Latvia's parliament declares Russia a state sponsor of terrorism due to the attacks on civilians in Ukraine, which sounds absolutely correct, I've got to say. Uh, again, they're both on the border. They're sort of teaming up. That's good to see. The only other obvious one on the border there is Belarus, which is a uh, which is pro-Russian. But uh, it's good to see these these smaller northern uh, countries on the border with Russia standing up to uh, to the big bear there. Uh, moving on with uh, let's see, so McDonald's uh, will start reopening stores in Ukraine. They had about 109, 110 from memory, from what I uh, read there. Uh, they will start to reopen them soon in a show of solidarity against Russia, where McDonald's pulled out of Russia some months ago. So you'll be able to get Maccas right next door in Ukraine, but not in Moscow. Sorry, I call it Maccas, uh, Macca D, depending on your country there too. Uh, let's see. So uh, more news out of the Zaporizhia region. This is probably the most confusing information uh, to date really for me. So Zaporizhia, uh, the occupied uh, area, so the Russian occupied area of Zaporizhia, uh, well, the, the pro-Kremlin, uh, sorry, I should say the, the occupied Zaporizhia pro-Kremlin regime has set a 30-day motion to hold a referendum on its annexation to Russia which will be conducted on the 11th of September unless the motion is withdrawn. This is particularly confusing for me because if you look at Zaporizhia, we've got the city and the oblast or the state or province of Zaporizhia. Yeah, two thirds of it is Russian controlled, but the, the final third of it where the largest city and the main area to it or main population zone is not taken by Russia. And yet they want to do an annexation to Crimea with a referendum, probably a forced and faked one. And I don't think they're going to take Zaporizhia probably ever, given that there's such a massive uh, natural obstacles in the way. Like they'd almost need to take a partial amphibious assault to do it, which is very difficult for any uh, country to do to any other country. It's It just doesn't see... Just more information to follow on this one. It's very confusing and weird. But um, that hasn't been in the news a lot, and it just seems like a really big deal to me. Now, last but not least, on the lighter side of news, there's a Ukrainian flag fence opposite the Russian embassy in D.C. Uh, two days ago, someone vandalized it, as we can see here. But then yesterday, the owners made some additional changes to it. I never thought of that either, changing a Z into a Zelensky. That's just pure, simple geniusness. All good there. So thanks for watching, guys. Please leave a comment, subscribe. Have a look at those comments. See some of the trolls in the comment section there. Like to show your prevailing sentiment about how you feel about these things. And uh, those, those trolls are just the worst. But thanks again for watching. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.